Chief Executive Fish Nerd of the Fish Nerds Podcast. <laughs> and I'm Michael Frank, lead guy to Frank's Fly Arts Fly Fishing Guide Service in Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, we're happy to have you, Frank. Welcome to the podcast where we talk about fish, fishing, and eating fish. Anything is fair game, and it's a good bet that you'll want to fish safer and longer after listening to this episode. So people are wondering, before we even begin, who is Michael Frank and why he's on the podcast? And uh, before you start talking, Mike, uh, Michael is a, our, our, one of our correspondents from Columbia, South Carolina, and he does a segment occasionally called Guides Corner. But Mike, who are you really? Uh, well, I'm a Spanish teacher. I uh, don't do this full time. Hola. And, exacto. <laughs> Hola, como están todos? Uh, bien, 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 gracias. Gracias. Fish nerds. <laughs> um, and uh, I guide part time when I'm not in school. I guide on weekends. I guide full time over the summer. Um, it's something I've always wanted to do, and I've been at it now for about nine years living here in South Carolina. Um, you know, we fish here for landlocked striped bass. Uh, Columbia and the rivers around Columbia are actually the birthplace of landlocked striped bass fishing. Um, they dammed up the Congaree River and uh, trapped them in, in between two dams, and there was just enough water and enough flow to allow the fish to reproduce without any access to salt water. Uh, but it, in addition, it sounds so cool, too, because I was down in South Carolina last spring, and my big regret is not getting to your place to fish. Uh, you still we the, the offer is it stands. We got to get you get you down it, it'll here. It'll happen. It'll happen. Um, but they've also been stocking trout here since the mid '60s, and we get some pretty impressive fish up in the 20 inch range, 20 inch plus range. Um, and in the past couple of years, they've been throwing in smallmouth. So it's a really unique fishery, and I, it's I love this place. It's my my adopted um, southern home. home I'm, I'm originally a New Yorker. <laughs> you could tell by your accent. Now I find it shocking that trout can get a foothold in those warm waters. Well, the funny thing is, you know, it, of course, it's a it's a tailwater. So Lake Murray Dam releases water from 80, 100 feet down. So the water is about 57 degrees at the base of the dam. It's cold. So it's definitely, yeah, it's definitely cold enough to support trout. Now, when you say support trout, that's one thing. But the, the amazing thing about this fishery is it's only been in the past couple of years that trout have been actually starting to reproduce on their own. Um, uh, we're not sure why. I think part of it has to do with the fact that there aren't quite as many striped bass as there used to be. Um, but you know what? We'll take it. I mean, having wild rainbow trout to fish over is, is, is awesome. Mm -hmm. Now, are your stripers uh, self-populated? They're reproducing there? Oh, man, that's a long story. Well, um, keep it short. It's yes or no question. I'll keep it short. <laughs> yes and no. Um, the, the fishery is is supplemented with two and a half million fingerlings down in Lake Marion at the southern end of the, or actually eastern end of the of the system. Um, but about a third of the fish in the river are here through natural reproduction. Which is awesome. Um, we got Yeah, it really is. I mean, we've got about a seven to nine year cycle where you know, one super class will reproduce really well in a wet winter that we'll have every seven to nine years. So yeah, it's, it's a really unique fishery. And then there's all sorts of oddball fish around too, like crappies and yellow perch and uh, gar and uh, even bowfin, just all sorts of crazy stuff out there. You just never know what you're going to catch. So lots you know, of good things. opportunity for a variety of fishes and in South Carolina, which is really great. And really cool. Like I, one of the things I really like about being part of this community that we're in, the fish nerds community is is how we make friends with one another so fast. And one of the people in our community, uh, Liam from Backwoods Graphics, he's the guy who makes our decals. He went to South Carolina and found time to hang out with you. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, that was really cool. I'm glad he got a chance to come down here and check the place out. Um, I wish we'd had a little more time, um, and I, I probably should have told him all the details. Um, <laughs> Piece of guide I mean, advice, always get uh, clarity on timing and... Uh, <laughs> and expectations of your trip, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, he did tell me he was bringing the family, and I, I pictured, you know, getting out in the evening after school and, and getting out of the river at 10 o'clock at night or so, and which, you know, I realized he had to drive down from Rock Hill, which is about an hour away, mm -hmm. up around Charlotte. But... Um, we got to we got to see a good part of the river. We got to see some some historic um, the historic dam where they uh, had a textile mill to produce cotton uniforms for the Confederacy and uh, an old the foundation of an old bridge that they burned down to keep Sherman from getting into uh, Columbia, which well didn't work. But <laughs> <laughs> you know what's neat about those uh, textile mills is those started off as northern textile mills, most of them, and 
they moved south for cheaper labor. So huh, like that, all of New England was sense. all of New England was textile mills was started off as textile mill towns. So places like Lawrence, uh, Lowell, Manchester, and those mills all closed and moved to South Carolina and all the places in the South. A little because, closer to the uh, raw materials, I guess, and cheaper labor. Yeah, and so a lot of the mills were owned by the same people, both North and South. That's cool. Yeah, it's funny the. Um, our state museum is right downtown near the old bridge, uh, right in the middle of Columbia that connects West Columbia and Columbia, two separate cities. It's it's long story, but anyway, um, the um, the state museum is an old textile mill that was converted to electricity by some folks from I want to say Connecticut, uh, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts, and they say it was the first factory in the history of the world to be powered by electricity produced off-site. Mm. Um, yeah, off-site it's, it's, it's a critical piece because the first town uh, in the world, they say, po- powered by electricity was Manchester, New Hampshire. Ah, cool. Yeah, the whole mill yard Very was powered neat. by uh, Edison's electric um, stuff that was running in the uh, Amoskeg Dam there. So. That's funny, cool. funny little Amoskeg, by the way, means great fishing place. And huh. traditionally, mills are built on rivers where the fishing is great. So we can get back to that fishing talk. Absolutely. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> All right. So let's give a run down the show. And if people want more information, they can go to your website, which is? Uh, www.franksflyarts.com. A very long name that's hard to forget once you've pronounced it correctly once. Right. I always say farts. That's my mistake. And, and yes, my brother <laughs> loves that. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and if you want to order some nice decals for your business, you can go to backwoodsgraphics.com. And all those links, of course, will be at fishnerds.com, which is the easiest I, I know place I to plan get. on talking to Liam about that. <laughs> yeah, he'll cut you a good deal. He makes a nice sticker, a nice decal, which I think you have some of. Okay, so today on the show, here's what's going to happen. We have Hugo from the Cape, uh, Hugo from Massachusetts, joining us, sharing a bluefish with mayonnaise recipe. Uh, Mike, you're going to talk a little bit about river safety and uh, a really terrible story that you told me the other day, which is why I wanted you here. We got yep. some fish in the news. We're going to talk about sharks and eclipses um, and, and uh, all kinds of other stuff. But before that, I've got two things we want to do. First, I've got a fishy voicemail. Um, last week, we had uh, someone's wife call in and do an anniversary thing. And now um, our fly fishing correspondent, Rich Collins, thinks using the Fish Nerds hotline might be a good way to get something from his wife. So here is Rich Collins. Hello, nerds. Uh, this is Rich Collins. I was so impressed with the anniversary shout-out, um, I thought I'd send in my own message here. Um, Sharon, if you're listening, I think it's about time we got a boat. Um, just saying. Communicating through podcasts is the latest and greatest thing. So um, a boat would be nice. I know you're sleeping in the car, but maybe subliminally you'll hear this. Hey. <laughs> if you didn't hear him clearly, he was using the Fish Nerds hotline to ask his wife to buy him a boat. Man. Yeah. And I, I that's, think that's a good way to do it. That's – wow. Yeah. I mean, that, it, That's a good woman there if she uh, accepts that, that challenge there. More impressive if she actually listens to the podcast, which <laughs> I would find that even <laughs> shocking. So, but hey, we're happy to have her have her aboard. Um, and I, the last few weeks, I spent a lot of times uh, insulting different states around the and countries. Oh, no. So I'm going to start off by uh, by by apologizing to the entire state of Maine. Um, I think two weeks ago, I said uh, the uh, people of Maine don't have teeth. Uh, I think I called them the great toothless masses. Uh, and then I got made fun of, so I then I sh- shot that towards Kentucky. Um, so, Maine, I think that some of you do have teeth, and Kentucky, <laughs> some of you also have teeth, so I apologize. Last week on the show, I described uh, Florida as Walmart with beaches. Uh, I, I was wrong. Uh, some of your towns are pretty far from the ocean, so apologies to Florida. And Australia... Uh, screw you. You don't need a, an apology. <laughs> You're super tough. <laughs> Drink a cold one and move on. So those are my four apologies uh, this week. I'm sorry, you guys. Uh, but bigger than that, we were giving away a fishing trip this summer, uh, MainTunaFishing.com, and we didn't get very many entries. And so I'm actually canceling the giveaway because I can't afford to give it away if I didn't get any return on investment. And return on investment would be getting people who care about it. 
So uh, I apologize for those who entered. A uh, few people donated $10 to the podcast for that entry. I'm going to e- offer you that money back. Or, if you'd rather, I'm going to send you a Fish Nerds limited edition hoorag. So it's up to you what you want to do. I'll email each of you individually. But my apologies. We will revisit this contest next year and run it a little bit differently and see if we can't get some more entries. But we only got a small handful of people. And so I couldn't um, I couldn't justify giving away a trip worth, you know, 800 bucks for just a handful of people. So I apologize for that. Uh, Mike, what do you think about that? Do you think I make a mistake by not giving it away? Or do you think it's uh, understandable? No, I think that's fair. It sounds fair to me. Yeah. Um, I know, you know, it's hard for me when I donate a trip and, and there's a silent auction. You know, I, I, I do it so that the charity will make money. And uh, occasionally I'll, you know, donate a trip that's worth $400 and they, they get, you know, maybe 50 bucks, 100 bucks. Oh, that makes me insane. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's sad. It's sad. Um, They'd I understand, be people, I understand people wanting a bargain, but, you know, you, you really, if you're, you're spending your money to support a good cause, you know, you'd think you'd pay at least the value of the of the item offered, or come close. Yeah, yeah. It's funny. I ran I ran a silent auction for a charity a couple of years ago, and we had ten thousand dollars worth of stuff donated, and we made about sixty five hundred dollars, and we spent huh. about twelve hundred dollars on the event. Wow. And I was thinking the whole time, you know what? We can get these same donations and put them all on eBay. And yeah. skip the event, <laughs> you know, and just yeah, make money. Exactly. So, so yeah, but apologies to all. I mean, that's seriously an apology to anyone who entered um, in good faith. Uh, but it's what are you going to do? It's real life, and things cost right. money. Um, so, <laughs> so we need a return <laughs> on that investment. In return, all we're looking for are people's email addresses. So for our for our mailing list, that's it. Um, hmm. But we didn't get nearly enough. So we were hoping for hundreds, not a couple dozen. <laughs> so, but let's move. Hey, Mike. Yes, Clay. <laughs> have you ever eaten bluefish? You know, I have. Um, and I'm not a big fish eater. I, I, I don't prefer to eat fish. I mean, a, a good piece of fish like lobster, I, I'll eat it. I mean, it's, it's tasty, but it's not worth wasting it on me, you know? Um, and, and as a kid, I used to fish in Huntington Harbor, where I'm from, up on, on Long Island in New York. And uh, I killed quite wrong, a few. By the way. Oh, yeah. How so? It's Long Island. Oh well, of course. Yeah, yeah it's true. I don't have the accent from nope. anywhere, nope. pretty much. <laughs> you're like you're like generic American. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Too much TV. You know, I watch yeah. too much TV news growing up or something. I get that long that mid. What is it? Midwestern accent. It's not quite Midwest either, but just kind of generic. But anyway, so we're catching <laughs> bluefish in Long Island. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, as a kid, that's what we did. We would we would fill buckets with 150, 200 snapper blues, um, and you know, we'd give them to our neighbors, and 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 sadly, a lot of them would just end up in the garden. But uh, when I moved to Baltimore, well, to DC, I would fish in Baltimore in the in the, in the Chesapeake Bay, and, and occasionally I would take a uh, a small bluefish home, and I found a couple of recipes I really liked, um, and and you know, that is the mayonnaise thing. Uh, on Long Island, it's kind of a classic way to bake bluefish. A big piece of chopper bluefish is kind of oily. They'll add mayonnaise and some Dijon mustard mixed in and mm-hmm. make it so that that, that oil min- kind of mixes and cuts the fishy flavor of the bluefish. So, you know, I guess my tastes changed a little bit as I got older and, and I could I could, I could could take it, I guess. And I, there's another one that I might have to suggest uh, Hugo try with some tomatoes and breadcrumbs, and it's kind of an Italian thing. It turns out more of a kind of more of a uh, casserole, I guess. Um, I love it. I love it. But yeah, it, it's it's good stuff when it's when it's fresh. Yeah, I mean, fresh I had, is really important, especially for bluefish. You really want that those oily fish. Yeah. You don't want to freeze them too long. Just cook them. Not not the kind of thing you necessarily want to buy at a market too far inland. That's for sure. That's true. Uh, now I I like snapper blues. I like to score them, and huh. season them heavily, and then cook them whole on the grill. That doesn't sound bad. Yeah, I could totally, see that. Totally tastes like good food. So, but here's Hugo uh, with his take on bluefish. Hey folks, Hugo Madero's here, cooking correspondent for the Fish Nerds. Check us out on uh, Facebook on the Fish Nerds podcast and fishnerds.com. So, working on some cool food as always here, keeping it interesting. So, um, I mentioned um, this summer I've been having a blast. I finally got out um, to get out in my kayak and saltwater fish on a weekly basis, learning a lot. 
get new, uh, discover new places, new techniques with uh, help from good friends and great kayak fishermen. So just the other day, I went out uh, to the ocean in Rhode Island and uh, had a blast. Awesome day. So I headed out there. I was uh, trolling a uh, Sabio Magic Swimmer on my way out to uh, do some ground fishing, trying to find uh, black sea bass, scup, fluke, and triggerfish. So yeah, I figured I'd throw I'd troll something on the way out and see if there's any blues or bass around. So I had my rod mounted on the plastic uh, ram rod mount. And uh, it bent in half, and my pole was in the water, and I, I've never seen the whole ram mount just give way and bend all the way down. Yep, so uh, I reeled it in. It was an uh, awesome bluefish, like one of the biggest ones I've caught. Um, weighed in at 8.8 .8 pounds. Thing was awesome. Jumped straight up out of the air a couple times. Um... It was a blast. I had a really good time. So then I caught another one of those, and I been uh, was lucky enough. Um, this is my second time catching triggerfish in July in Rhode Island, which is really weird. Typically, they don't come up here uh, until later on, like September, when the water's really warm, since they're tropical fish. But it was awesome. The uh, week before when I first caught them... Um, was out floating in my kayak. I'm looking around. I see these weird fins on top water, and I start seeing things chasing my jig right up to the top of the water column. Um, wasn't expecting triggerfish in mid-July, so I had no idea where what it was. They didn't look like scup, but I couldn't figure out what the heck it was. So I told my buddy, I go, uh, I think these got to be triggerfish. And then I started looking around. They were circling my kayak. They're not shy at all. They were literally swimming all around and underneath me. And um, there must have been hundreds and hundreds of them. So for a couple hours, unfortunately, I didn't have uh, small hooks because they, they're, they're bait stealers. They got really small mouths with really sharp teeth. So all they do is tear apart your, your lures or your baits to shreds. So, uh, yeah, I managed to get, I don't know, about eight of them that day. And those were phenomenal. That is one of my favorite fish uh, of all time. Uh, sea bass and those are just absolutely amazing. So now, but what I'm doing tonight is I got the second bluefish that I caught, the small one. And we're doing something wicked cool with it that I got the idea from the book called Blues by John Hersey, that's H-E-R-S-E-Y, and this is a wonderful book. Um, this man was a, a fisherman, uh, loved the bluefish, he lived on the Cape, and he just uh, talks about, uh, he meets this stranger who's never fished before, he brings him out on his boat, and uh, it, it's just a lot of fun reading. Uh, really enjoyable, really quick read. And at the end of each chapter, they get back home from a day of fishing, and he has a different uh, bluefish recipe. So this is the second one in the book that gave me this idea. So basically, I took the uh, bluefish fillet, uh, broiled it, and what I put on it is I mixed uh, light mayonnaise, a good amount of dill, so a half cup of mayonnaise, maybe three tablespoons of dill, a tablespoon of coarse Dijon mustard, a little bit of salt, and uh, I happen to have a vinaigrette uh, close by from the other day of a really, really good top quality certified extra virgin olive oil and uh, vinegar. So I had a vinaigrette, so I just put you know a teaspoon of that in there because it's, it's a great flavor, and that... Got basted all over the top of the filet. The filet went in the oven for eight minutes because this fish is maybe three quarters of an inch thick. So Hersey says the, the, uh, in the book, the tip to go by for cooking uh, bluefish, well, any kind of fish, he suggests, is uh, cook it 10 minutes for every one inch of uh, thickness. 
So this one a little bit less than one inch. So I did it for uh, eight minutes. I, I hate overcooking fish anyway, so I was real careful with it. But that's it. And we're going to give this a shot. And it is going to be uh, awesome. Actually, you know what? I'll just give it a taste right now. See what we got. Looks cool. That mayonnaise was so tasty. Okay, let's see what we got. Mmm. Oh, that's super good. Nice, great flavor. The fish is super moist. People are afraid, a lot of, most people are afraid of bluefish that I've seen in the U.S. anyways. Um, it's, I mean, well, we say this all the time, you got to take care of it properly. So as soon as you catch it, you have to bleed it out so you can cut off the tail or slice uh, under the gills and let all the blood pump out into the water, get it on ice, and then eat it as soon as you can. So this one, I did that right away. Uh, it was alive on the side of my boat when I got on shore. I bled it, put it in a cooler filled with ice, brought it home, and vacuum sealed it. And here we are a couple days later, and um, it's great, great fish. All right, folks, take care. Hugo Madero's fishing correspondent for the Fish Nerds, signing out. See you, everybody. Tight lines. Well, hey, thanks, Hugo. That sounded really delicious. And if you want to follow right. along with Hugo's recipes, just go to uh, the Fish Nerds Facebook group and follow along. And uh, he's right there. And he will answer all your fish cooking questions. Do you, do you, is there anything you won't eat, uh, Mike? Well, you know, I mean, really larger bluefish. <laughs> <laughs> if, if they're big and oily, I don't want them. I was raised um, on large bluefish. So to me, that seems like food. I, I don't know the difference. I mean, that's yeah, I have, growing up, I had an aunt that loved them too. So... We always had someone that would take them, and I, I could fillet them pretty good. So, well, and they're easy to fillet, which is nice. So they're yeah. fun to catch. Man, are they fun! To oh catch. my gosh, yeah. I think, Thirty miles per hour. <laughs> I think. I think. I think a bluefish is more fun to catch than a striped bass. I'm just saying. Right. I mean, I remember when I was a kid. You know, my mom used to love going on the on the party boats out mm -hmm. of Cap Tree, and and we would always go for fluke. We'd go for for summer flounder, right. and uh, you know. She, I, I convinced her one time to go on a boat on the north shore of Long Island and uh, go for bluefish, and we were diamond jigging, um, and and she got a kick out of it. But by the time she was done dropping that jig down fifty or hundred feet and cranking it all the way to the surface as fast as possible, you know, she said she had fun, but she's like, you know, that was real work. You know, it was not exactly her cup of tea. She liked to just. Bounce the bottom with a with a weight and a and a minnow. <laughs> right. Well, when you're when you're jigging that deep, those diamond jigs, you're looking at like a ten ounce, twelve ounce jig. They're monstrous usually, and we find uh, well, that with cod fishing, they're like one pounders, and it, that's yeah, as much that work as catching see. a fish. Uh, we, we used we to troll like for two or three ounces. Oh, that's, that's, that's not. Oh, that's small. Yeah. Oh, that's nothing. But it was work. It was constant moving and yeah. reeling and cranking. And then once you hooked one, it was more work. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but, but the good kind of work, right? It's exciting. Exactly. Well, it's funny because I, I, you know, when we go jigging for like cod and haddock and halibut, it's jig, 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 and then reel and really slow, not a lot of fight. But with yeah. bluefish, when you get them, it's a whole different world. And we always yeah. trolled for them as a kid using giant squid baits and... Huh. We would get these like okay. thirty pound. I'm exaggerating, probably twenty pound fish. A huge, yeah, no. huge blue fish, and a lot of fun off the coast of New Jersey. So yeah, really good, my, really fun. My favorite part of of getting on a party boat and doing that was the dance. I mean, you know, you'd, you'd have to go up and over and around and under everybody yes. and, you know, to try and not tangle your lines. Impossible. <laughs> it's not possible not to tangle. So, yeah. That's why they go for flounder and not bluefish most of the time because they don't want to deal with it. It's fishing on the bottom, sure. you're straight down, you're probably okay. And and it gets dangerous with all those those jigs, you know, swinging around and you know you try to fling one over the side and the hook comes out, that thing shoots back. It does. It does indeed. But you know, that's real life. Anyway, thanks Hugo yeah. for uh, for sharing that recipe with us. We appreciate it. <laughs> uh, hey, got to move on a little bit. Our, our show is supported by listeners through a website called Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And we're asking all listeners to give us a dollar an episode, $4 a month, to help support the show. And Mike, you're not going to believe this. I've partnered with Hoorag. Have you heard of Hoorags? Huh. Yeah, I have. Yeah, I partnered with Hoorag to get custom fish nerds um, 
I want to say the word buff, but that's a that's a trademarked word. But, gotcha. Uh, uh, but neck, you can still you can still gator. wear it like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> neck gaiters uh, from Hurag. Um, and the only way to get them right now is to donate at the two dollar per episode level with the fish nerds. So go to patreon.com slash fish nerds. When you click the little That's box donate, cool. do two dollars. That's eight dollars a month, and you will get a who rag, you'll get some decals, a letter from me, and you'll be supporting a podcast that hopefully you're enjoying. Uh, at That's eight dollars a month. It's not a bad deal. Yeah. Um, and you can cancel any time. So you can get your who rag and then say, you know what, screw you guys. Um, I don't want you to do that, but you could. <laughs> but anyway, the only way to get the who rags right now are through our Patreon, or unless you're a Fish Nerds um, correspondent, in which case I'll mail you one because I like you. So, Mike, you're going to get one. <laughs> and they've got, oh, thank you. Yeah. Awesome. And they've got that, that uh, the Fish Nerds logo that, that Liam Geary did, you know, the Backwoods Graphics logo? Yeah, yeah. He didn't design the logo, but he puts that on, his, on the decals. So Dave Callum designed the logo. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's neat. Yeah. Maybe I need to talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> Dave's a good logo designer, yeah. He'll, he'll charge you an arm awesome. and a leg, but he does a good job. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Hey, speaking of uh, – anyway, so patreon.com slash fish nerds. And by the way, if you donate at the $25 episode level, that's $100 a month. That's a lot of money, and I want it. But $100 a month uh, will get you a mention on the show. So I will talk about your business. So for example, my friend Josh Lopes donates $25 an episode. So I will say if you want a good tax guy, <laughs> go to lopestax.com and – and talk to Josh about getting your taxes done. If you're in Massachusetts um, and you want a good accountant, he's a great guy. Um, I was in the river with his kids today, swimming and having a good time. Uh, but he donates at that level. He's going to get a who rag, uh, of course. Plus, he gets everything else we have because he's our, our biggest uh, donor. Um, and he's bald, so the who rag will come in handy <laughs> to keep the sun off of his shiny uh, head. So, who rags? <laughs> Patreon.com slash fishnerds. Links at fishnerds.com. All right, Mike, now is time. Time for the okay. no fun part of the show. Uh, the reason I asked Michael to come on the show today is because Michael was telling me about um, river safety. He had run a brush with um, reality recently, and I'm going to let Mike, I'm going to let you t- tell the story, and I'm going to just kind of steer you along and ask questions as we go. So, All right, Clay. Well, well okay. I'm, I'm going to start off by saying you asked for it. I know. I know that, you know, I can talk. I mean, yes. uh, this is kind of one of my pet peeves. So, you know, <laughs> No pun intended. Give me the hook when it's time. You got it. Um, but uh, I was out fishing this summer. It was kind of it was a strange day all around. We put in at the ramp um, we normally put in at. I had a young man with me who would, who had fished out west for trout. He he wanted to go out and catch some trout. Um, I should have known right off the start that it was going to be a weird day when we drifted past the ramp and a kayaker came up and said, y'all can't go down that way. The police are down there. Somebody drove a pickup truck into the river. Well, it looked to me like somebody had driven that pickup truck off the ramp and it must have drifted about a thousand feet downstream. The police did tell us to steer clear of it. There was a good two feet of water over the top of the cab of this pickup truck. The weirdest thing I've seen, I had seen in a long time in that river. Um, But the real trouble happened towards the end of the day. We'd, we'd had a pretty good day and caught a bunch of fish, and, and we ended up at this spot um, downstream from a, a spillover um, that's called the Pop-Up Hole. Um, it's on the lower Saluda River where the water is really cold. It's a, it's a tailwater, so again, it averages about 57 degrees year-round. And it's back behind the zoo here in Columbia, which is a, a spot that people like to hang out and, and play at. They'll, you know, take a couple beers out there and a boom box or whatever, and just hang out and swim and fish and, and kayak, that kind of thing. Um, and I'd only seen people go over the, um, the pop-up hole once or twice without flotation. Um, occasionally you young flotation, kids. flotation, like without a life jacket or a Life boat? jacket, uh, a, a tube. I mean, you know, our rivers are, are really popular for tubing. I mean, Columbia, South Carolina, our, our slogan, our tourism slogan has been the ever clever um, Columbia, South Carolina. We're famously hot and surprisingly cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
and and it does get hot. I mean, it gets up to 100 degrees multiple days over the summer. Yeah, I, was, I was there last summer. It's a terrible place. Terrible. Yeah, this, this summer this summer has been balmy. It's been beautiful. Uh, I don't think it broke 95 too many times this summer. So, you know, 90, 93, we're happy. Yeah. Um, but you know, we've got this beautiful river and it's nice and it's, it's really pretty clean. I mean, it can support trout, um, and stripers and, you know, uh, lots of wildlife, clear water. And so people like to get in and swim, but too often people don't come prepared. And, um, what happened that day was we floated past these two guys that were up in the rocks and they were kind of hanging out with their, with their families. Um, I, I assume, and, uh, they were wading between rocks and kind of heading towards the pop-up hole where the water all kind of channelizes and spills over for a four foot drop. Um, but they didn't seem like your average, like teenagers or, or college kids that would jump in there and swim. And, and of course they didn't have life jackets on. So we bounced through in the, in my inflatable, in my, my inflatable drift boat. No problem. I mean, just bounce, bounce, we're through. And uh, I anchored off to the side because it was a good place to cast for stripers. And we start casting. I look upstream, and sure enough, they're on the very edge of it, and they step off. And they, they go under, and their heads pop back up, you know, a few feet downstream. And I turn to my client and I say, oh, I might catch the big one today. Um, I, won't, I won't be saying telling that joke anymore. No, um, gosh, no. Yeah, because... The guys kind of floated past a few feet away from us, and the one was a bit younger. I mean, he might have been in his late 30s. Uh, the other guy was was a bit older, balding on top, a bit of a belly on him. And they were staying in the middle of the channel, more or less, in the middle of the run. Um, I, I expected them any minute to just peel out and swim into shore, but they stayed together. And they didn't say anything to us as they went past or anything. Eventually, the younger guy took off and and swam the 30 feet or so to the shore. But the older gentleman, he was, I thought he was treading water. So I pulled in the anchor as I noticed that he was in trouble, started rowing after him, and his head just bobbed lower and lower, and his nose hit the water. And by the time we got, yeah, by the time we got to him, it was like a watermelon bobbing at the surface of the, of the river. Oh, um, man, it was sorry. just the top of his head that we could see. Um, so by the time we got to him, we were only 20 feet or so from shore and the water was, was pretty shallow. And my client actually jumped off the boat and grabbed him and dragged him up on shore, turned him over. We found the, um, found the flattest area we could, which was a rock that kind of sloped back towards the river, unfortunately, but it was the best we could do. I mean, he probably weighed about 300 pounds. Oh, man. Uh, That's so Yeah, funny. I mean, you know, his friend had, had already run over, and he's like, oh, man, what are we going to do? You know, I, and I told him, I said, I, I know CPR. I'm going to go ahead and do it. And he's like, you know, please do. He goes, and, and I start performing CPR and giving rescue breaths, which – if you're CPR certified, that's wonderful. But, you know, I got to say, you're going to – please, I hope that you never have to use those skills. Um, it's, it is, it's, uh, it's a fun. scary, scary thing. Um, but, uh, you know, as I'm doing compressions, the friend – volunteers the information he's like well he goes billy just wanted to do this one last time he says you know we did this back when we were in high school and he just was remembering those days and you know i, I told him it might not be a good idea because you know he has a has a heart condition and it was like yeah <laughs> no, it, it's it's so horrible and and you're there and you feel like you own this right like this is part of oh, yeah. who you are it's part of your being when once, you're trying to yeah, help I someone mean, you own that person and, and if you're certified in CPR, once you start, you can't stop. No, you have um, to keep going. You know, I, I was shocked to find out that, well, when the when the um, EMS guys got there, uh, he told he told us to just keep doing compressions. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remembered from my training that technically they don't recommend that you do rescue breathing. But I knew it was going to be – it took, took them about 10 minutes to get there, which considering that we were on That's the other fast. side of the river. Yeah, we were inside – the botanical garden side, like the, the zoo is, it, it spans both sides of the river and there was no good access point at that place. So they had to come in on the Columbia side 
go into the zoo, go down, go across the footbridge and come down the opposite shoreline. So, I mean, 10 minutes that they got there quickly. That's amazing. I, you know, it, uh, I'll, right. the only time I was ever with someone when they died, it was behind the fire department. They were a hundred feet away and took them 10 minutes to get there. So, wow. Um, yeah. So that's, you know, I know the feeling <laughs> like there's never fast enough though. It's never fast yeah. enough. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it just, you know, I, and, and uh, I don't know. Well, I do, and and so so you were you were doing chest compressions and first aid, and you're owning this, and this is part of like you're doing all the right things, you know. You, right. You did right. you did what most people don't do, which is action. You took action, right? And right. and now you're dealing with this, and you did the chest compressions and rescue breathing, and 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 the guy didn't make it, right? Exactly right. Um, I mean, and, and they that's told impossible. they told me. Yeah, they told me that he was he was minimally responsive, minimally responsive when they took him away. But I mean, honestly, when the guy, when, when we turned him over and he was on that rock and, and I looked and his lips were blue and his eyes were rolled back in his head, I, I got to say the thought crossed my mind. I'm looking at a dead guy here. Yeah. But you still did. The so, but you got, but you got to do it. I mean, you have to do it because if you didn't do it, cause you're, I know that I know what you're, I know you. Yeah. And I know, have, and you're already yeah. like, I should have taken action faster. You're already beating yourself up and running the scenarios right. your head over and over again, even though you did everything right. But you're still going to relive that day as if I only I had done this different. Right. Which, and is, you know, this, which is you can't, you know, you're going to do it. It's not your fault. Right. You know? The saddest thing about this, though, for me is that safety on my river here, on the river, well, I call it my river. I mean, you our river, Columbia. River. Yeah. Um, it's it's one of my pet peeves. Mm-hmm. When I first moved down here, it, it, the, the river, the lower Saluda River is used for hydropower. Mm-hmm. Uh, South Carolina Electric and Gas, S-E-E-G, um, is allowed to open that dam up whenever they want to and, uh, and produce electricity. Now, in the last few years, they haven't been doing it as much. Um, it used to be when I first moved down here in 2005 – at least once a month, they would blast the river out at 20,000 cubic feet per second, where it would come up and cover boulders that were, you know, normally they'd be, right. they'd bring it up six feet. But they did, do, they, did, did they do it on a schedule or when they feel like it? When they feel like it. Okay, because up, is... here, up here, the rivers that do that, they have it on a schedule, and actually um, whitewater rafting companies... Right. Rely on that schedule for that release. And, for and I mean, even even up in North Carolina, Duke Electric, they they keep they keep in mind the recreational users on the river too. And and I don't mean to badmouth South Carolina Electric and Gas. I mean, well, they you have, should um, because you should because it's oh, it, <laughs> they, they've come a long way. They I mean, have, they've, they they they've, they've made because you know I'll my my, them. <laughs> my 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 pet peeve is. Back when I first moved here, they had a set of sirens along the river, Mm -hmm. but you couldn't hear them everywhere. So people would fall asleep out on the rocks or, you know, they'd be drinking or whatever, just hanging out out there. And they would ignore the sirens and and people would have to be rescued by the rescue squad in the in the inflatable with the motor and all that um, in the Zodiac. But they back in, I want to say 2008, started a cell phone warning system and. I was actually in the the pilot program for that. Um, I I called to ask about what the river level would be that weekend. Um, And I I managed to get through to somebody who was actually working at the dam, which was like a a near miracle right there. Um, And this guy told me, he's like, no, you know, we don't plan on blasting the river out tomorrow. Um, And, uh, you know, but if you call this number, like we're starting a cell phone warning system. So, you know, if you call this number, they might sign you up for it. And I, I hung up with him. I thanked him for, for the info and called that number and got a hold of an older lady who I guess was some receptionist. And I said, you know, I'd like to apply for the cell phone warning system. Immediately she goes, who gave you this number? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, well, you know, I called. He wasn't supposed to. He wasn't supposed to give you this. This is, this is a pilot program. She goes, it's only for businesses. What business are you with? I said, um, I'm with Frank's Fly Fishing Guide Service, which, of course, didn't exist at the time. It doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. And she, she goes, well, why do you need this information? I said, well, <laughs> I'm on the river. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, ma'am, I'm going to be guiding people in the river wading and fishing. And, you know, I don't want to drown. and I certainly don't want them to drown. So she gave me the number of the coordinator, and he, he hooked me up with it. And uh, I actually – it got to the point where, you know, they put it on their website and – 
the website would tell you what the river conditions were at that time. But the only place you could actually see where it said sign up for cell phone warnings was a tiny little orange button at the very bottom of the screen. You had to screen that you had to scroll all the way down to, to find. Yeah. Um, So during that time, like I would go through the river and I'd tell everybody, I mean, the kids floating in the tubes and stuff. I just ask them, Hey, you got a cell phone? Yeah, dude, you got to make a call. I'd be like, no, do you know about the warning system? And and never, nobody ever knew. Well, uh, it's also, I mean, think about this. You're in a tube floating down the river. Right. It, cell phone warning system system doesn't make sense. <laughs> it doesn't. Well, I mean, the way I do it, um, I mean, I always tell my clients, the people that I fish with, I, I, I tell them all about it. And I've got um, a little Walmart um, dry bag thing that I can actually clip around a strap on my life jacket and it for floats, um, right? and, and yeah, it, it floats, it keeps it dry. In fact, I can even talk through the, uh, it, it's got a clear cover. I can talk through the plastic covering. I can use the phone through it. Um, so, you know, I know that if the, I think it's like nine, 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 it's, it's two, one, seven, nine, 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 nine. Uh, if that, if that number pops up on that screen, the water's coming up. Um, or, you know, and, and if I answer it, you get a robocall that tells you it's coming to the red, st- the, the blue stage, which is low, the yellow stage, which is medium, or the red stage, which is high. The problem is when I, I would talk to people about river safety around here and they would say, well, you know, we're just kind of thin, thin herd. You, you can't you can't change people. They're just going to do what they're going to do. Sure. Um, and I mean, I went so f- I went so far as to call one of the local news stations that had a problem solvers piece they did once a week and suggest that maybe they should publicize this number. Sure. Um, and then I had the river come up on me one day and I thought to myself, you know, for one thing, the electric company might not like that I did that. And for another thing, if somebody did get stuck out there and, and their system went down, they'd be blaming me too. <laughs> Um, yeah. So, you know, I, I even called the electric company and talked to one of their executives and the guy said, well, why would you want to do that? Why would you want to tell the public about that? We're, we're afraid it'll crash the system if we have tourists come from Florida or from Georgia and spend the week here and, and then they won't take it off their phone and okay. they'll be getting calls. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, one o'clock in the morning, they don't want to know that the river's coming up in Columbia, South Carolina. They're going to figure out a way to take it off well, their phone. Also, nobody wants it at one in the morning, I suppose. unless they're camping, I guess maybe they would. Right. I mean, and, and you can set it for 8, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. or, or 24-7. Right. So. Well, you know, it's, it's any way you can help people is really important. And, right. And, the, the, and you have to give them the benefit of the doubt of, of having a brain. I mean, just, right. just trust that people will – at least you're saving lives. I mean, yeah. Well, there's, there's going to be that. people who are going to do things that are unsafe no matter what. That's right. and that's that warning right. system would not help the person you dealt with. No, right. No. Um, and I think what people need to realize is that uh, and, I, and my kids and I we play in rivers. So my kids and I are in the river almost every day in the summertime, and we play mm-hmm. in the rapids and we float downstream on our butts feet first, and we do these little kind of games. But all of them lead to the kids knowing how to read the water and do the, and, and and save themselves if something happens. Right. And I and just like hiking or mountain climbing. People don't understand that in the river, the only one who can keep you safe is you. Right. Like it, they, it, there's nobody else can do it. You have to be responsible for yourself. Um, you could mitigate. You can have other people nearby. But and ultimately, you have to know what you're doing and be in control of your own body. And, and something you have bad to be happens, educated. Yeah. And if something you have bad to know, happens, it's, it's on you. You have to know what situations are dangerous too. I mean, Absolutely. people don't understand what a strainer is. People don't understand that, you know, just getting in a tube is not flotation enough. No. Um, <laughs> oh God. I mean, well, yeah. I mean, up here where I live, there's a, there's a Saco River, and the Saco River is, is a big tourist draw, and people get in tubes and they float for six miles down the river, mm-hmm. and they get in trouble on the way. It's very familiar. <laughs> they, they they have coolers that are that. They spend more time shopping for a flotation for their cooler than for themselves. Absolutely. You know, so they're, yeah. they're, their cooler will be just fine, but they're going to be stuck in strainers and their tubes are going to pop and they're going to figure that out. So it's, it's a challenge everywhere right. you go. Back to your, the person who didn't make it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and just kind of, I know you don't need me to let you off the hook on this, but, 
but having been in that similar situation, I had a guy in the ice die a couple of years ago. I, he wasn't yeah, with right me. I was, I was trying to rescue him, uh, and he died. And I and I took that with me. I carried that for a long time. Uh, you're going to carry this for with for a long time. You're going to play this over and over again. But just for people listening, uh, CPR, first aid, all really good to know. But generally speaking, people do not survive CPR. It's not. It's like 18 percent of people actually survive getting CPR. It's a really low number. Um, you do what you can, but but it's not your fault when it's not not enough. Right. You know. You can't. I mean, and you, you can't save uh, everybody. I don't know if this is wrong to say, or you know, sadly, I did take something away from it, which is I now know I I will do it, mm-hmm. and I know how to do it in a in a real situation. Well, yeah, and that's you know, I mean, it, it motivated me. Yeah, yeah, it motivated. I mean, I'm a first responder at my elementary school too, so I'd been trained, you know, multiple years, mm-hmm. and I knew that my my certification was coming due. So rather than even do the course at my school district, I went straight to the, to the Red Cross and, and got certified for like adult, um, what is it? Adult child and AED and first aid. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I have you know, what I have. just, just got to refresh it, you know, make sure you know what you're doing. Yeah. It actually makes me want to do, you've just motivated me because my town's offering solo offers these backwoods, um, like mountain rescue oh, courses. Man. And I'm thinking about I, now, maybe I need to be solo certified, which is a bigger deal than just CPR first aid. Um, because you know, you never know. And the more, yeah. the more experience you have, the more things that happen, the better. Yeah. That, that actually sounds really cool. I wish they offered it's, it's, they, they do have wilderness first aid down here, but it doesn't get the classes rarely actually run. Cause not that many people are interested in doing it. Yeah. I mean, I live in a mountain community, so it's, it's, actually, right. it's common. Uh, there's whole, there's a whole school designated to it, but, but I might um, need to come up there and do that. You know, you come <laughs> up here, you, you, do, up you come up here this winter, <laughs> you, you can stay at my place. Yeah. You do that. Um, I'll, I'll do it with you. I'll wait and cool. we'll go, we'll go ice fishing and have a good time. Sounds I'll find good. a schedule, send it out to you. But, uh, but you know what? Um, the fact that you did something, you took action. It's it's nothing short of heroic. Um, oh well, <laughs> it really it really is. The fact that you did anything at all. Most people sit around and think, "What should I do?" and don't take action. The fact that you took action is huge. Um, I know that even if you haven't talked to the person's family, they know that you took action and you tried. And right. um, I mean, I was fortunate. I heard from the person's family a lot. Um, the person who died with me. Um, yeah, and they they yeah. gave me that. You know, they told me, "Hey, you you know, you tried." Um, they know you tried, right? And, right. And for them, that's a big deal. The fact if no one tried at all, they wouldn't have anything. But the yeah. fact that you made the effort, um, nothing short of heroic. Um, I appreciate that you're one person on the water because if I'm ever on the water, I want you near me, if something <laughs> happens. So, um, I'm getting a little teary because I I know the feelings on this. Um, but it's, it's a big yeah. deal that you did anything at all. And it, it's no comfort me saying you're heroic, <laughs> but it, <laughs> it doesn't make anything better, but, uh, it really is amazing. Um, and I thank you for sharing that. And I encourage everyone on the river, put on your life jacket. That's right. My God. I, th- I mean, so many, I could, I couldn't it, even tell you how many yes. stories. I mean, ah. One of my favorite ones, somebody came down from Charlotte. It was a whole family and, uh, at the time, like I used to carry the boat in. So I've got the boat on my head with my clients helping me carry it in, which if anyone's coming south, we don't do that anymore. So I won't make you work. But anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, but this, this lady walks up to me and she says, you know, we're from Charlotte and we're down here visiting friends. And um, they told us that we're going to tube through here. Uh, but they said, we don't really need life jackets, you know, but Walmart's right up the road. You know, we can just run and pick up some life jackets for the kids at least if we need to. Yes. What do you think? Do it. Well, I was wearing a life jacket with a 15-foot long raft that's seven feet wide with 26-inch tubes on my head. Mm-hmm. And I said to her, I was like, ma'am, you see this boat, right? And you see that I, I have a life jacket on. Now, chances are I'm not falling out of this boat, but... The rapid down there is not a joke. Mm-hmm. I'm like, if I were you, I would get in that car. I mean, the river's going to be here when you get back. You know, get those life jackets. And as I turn to walk away, she goes over and says, "This guy says we ought to have life jackets to her friend who lives here." And that lady's like, "Y'all don't need no life jackets. You're gonna be just fine. We do this all the time." I was like, "Oh no," yeah. you know. And, and by the way, odds are she's gonna be just fine. 
Yeah, true. But true. But it's a it just good takes idea. that one time. It yeah. does. It does. Yeah. Um, and I'll admit, I take off my life jacket sometimes. Um, <laughs> but, yeah. But the more of these stories I hear, the more I wear it. Um, yeah. And, I, and less, I less, I wear it less on a on a lake in the summer than on the river. By the way, it's. Uh, but you should be wearing them. Uh, and uh, I was actually invited a person on the show tonight, who was on a bass fishing tournament and was thrown off his boat, Ooh. and knocked unconscious. And a life jacket saved his life. He was going to come on tonight, but wow. I, couldn't, I couldn't arrange it. Um, but I will. Uh, I'll try to get him on because he's on a big campaign to get bass fishermen to wear life jackets. That's that's very cool. Yeah. That's very important. I've heard way too many stories. Like lately, I've been hanging out with some captains down in, in Charleston. And, and a few of my clients this year were telling me um, just horror stories. I mean, I, you know, I just row a little little rubber boat, basically. Um, there's no speed involved. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I get up to a blazing four miles per hour. <laughs> a blazing. Well, if the river's taking you along, you can maybe go a little faster. Yeah. But, uh, uh, well, anyway, so the takeaway yeah. here is put on a life jacket so Michael doesn't have to drag you in the water. <laughs> I mean, that's really important. <laughs> so, yeah. But, hey, thanks for sharing that story with us. Excuse my language no on that problem. piece. And I am <laughs> as guilty as anyone as making these same mistakes uh, as not wearing life jackets. So uh, take a deep breath. Here we go. <sighs> news, news, fish in the news. Everybody loves their about some fish in the news. Fish in the news. I love fish in the news. Everyone loves the fish in the news. And we're going to start off with what happens in the sea during an eclipse. You were in huh. South Carolina during the eclipse, right? Yep. And so you yep. were in like that path of totality. Exactly. Oh, it was a big deal down here. It was I a mean, big deal Columbia. Here. We were far away. Col- Cola Town, like, geared up for it. They were predicting four million people to visit. We even had a local artist, um, I think a, a nonprofit, um, dreamt up this scheme to put lasers <laughs> over the river. They're, like, shooting them from buildings and, and, and bouncing them off mirrors so that they have beams of laser beams, like, uh, shooting under the bridges and stuff. I mean, it was, it was something else. I mean, I, all I could think was Austin Powers, you know, freaking lasers on their heads exactly. or striped bass That's are going to have exactly freaking lasers on their heads. <laughs> it's a big deal. Now, up here, it was a big deal. and We were only like 65% uh, in the path, so we didn't see much. Huh. Uh, we didn't get dark. It, it didn't feel like clouds going over our heads. It didn't feel like anything. Unless you were looking at the sun with your glasses on, you would not have known something was happening. So it's still pretty cool. Yeah, it was really cool. But we were jealous of you guys. Uh, but there's been a lot of question. What happens to wildlife during an eclipse? And you know from, you know, down your way, it got dark and the cicadas started singing and the crickets come oh, out. Yeah. The chickens go to bed. But what happens in the ocean? And so I have a link up at fishnerds.com from Deep Sea News. And it's an article in depth of what happens in the sea during a solar eclipse. And they had opportunity to go actually go out and measure what happens. And the last time they measured this was 1960, and of course, a couple of days ago, they were able to measure it again, huh. uh, which is really cool. But just like, um, just like on land, animals think it's nighttime, right? So I'm not going to read the I'm not going to read the article. I'm going to talk about. I read it earlier, so I'm going to talk about it a little bit. So what happens in the ocean is all the there's a lot of deep sea animals that live. They call it a false bottom. If you're using a sonar system, you'll see the bottom of the ocean. And then a certain amount of feet up, you'll see um, a, another bottom of the ocean. And that's, huh. that's a level where the animals are living in darkness. And they're okay. down that deep to keep them out of where the predators are in the upper water. But at so nighttime, those animals... They're already in darkness, right? Yeah, they're down deep, right? So, so, but the eclipse still affects them somehow. Right, because at every night, at night, those animals who are down... Let's say... I'm going to make up a number because I'm not going to read the article. Uh, right, right, right. But let's say you're down at 100 feet. They Actually, they were... They were um, yeah, anyway. Let's say they're down below the ocean at a couple hundred feet uh-huh. or whatever. They will swim up at nighttime towards the top. Okay. And that's where they're going to do a lot of their feeding. All the plankton and all the stuff lives up in that upper um, part of the water. Oh, okay. So during the eclipse, these animals who are down, you know, you know, actually it's like 4,000 meters down. It's really deep. Um, Yeah. They're they're down really deep. During the eclipse, they make a beeline towards the surface as (laughs) as if it's nighttime. 
and then so you're able to measure this using sonars, and then as the as it goes from total moon. eclipse and starts moving yeah. onward, those fish have to make a race back down towards the bottom. Huh. And not just fish; it's all kinds of sea life. It's fish, it's oh, octopuses, yeah. it's all kinds of things. So it, every cool. all the animals in the path, whether the land animals or sea animals, act like it's um, act like it's nighttime. So it's it's pretty. Um, it's pretty cool and pretty interesting to see, see, see it really happening. And so science scientists love this stuff. That's cool. It pro- probably would have been some pretty good fishing while that was going on. We, we were not far from the river, and I went down just like before the uh, the moon passed across completely. And a buddy of mine was down there with his little boy. He, he found a gar that was up in like a foot of water yes. and, a, and a catfish, yes. you know, that was – 18 inches long again like right up in a foot of water i don't know what they were doing up there they were coming in to so, feed like it was nighttime you know I the, guess the so. catfish come in really shallow water to eat at nighttime i imagine gar aren't any different huh. um, so yeah all the fish all the animals think it's nighttime so yeah you could have you missed an opportunity yep nah, oh well <laughs> <laughs> give, give a break for that day you know yeah. <laughs> yeah but man how cool was it to be down there for that we're and now in seven years in new hampshire we're going to be in the path of totality Oh, neat. I, I'd heard something about Ohio, so I guess you guys are in the, yeah, yep. in that band too. That's cool. Yeah, which I can't wait, and then you could be jealous of us. Exactly, or I can come up there. <laughs> or yeah, come, yeah, come up. I mean, we actually we actually have a place in in, um, in Folly Beach, South Carolina, we have access to. My, my in-laws own a place. Nice. There, and we were considering going down, and then we saw the news, and it right. looked like half the planet was going down. So we decided not to bother. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, it's a, it's Charleston a, was crazy. I, I was down there over the weekend, and, yeah. and the traffic definitely picked up. In fact, uh, people that had come in um, were telling me they're like, it was it was Sunday night that I turned around to go back to to Columbia, and they're like, "Good luck, you you might not make it home." Oh my god, <laughs> wasn't that bad though? No, but I mean, it's so cool. And how fun is it? I mean, I had a friend who um, who's a who, who was not excited about the eclipse. He was like, I don't understand what the fuss is all about. All these people, the media making a big blah, blah, blue, blah, blah, like this, like negative <laughs> fancy. And I'm like, yeah. how cool is it that everyone is outside enjoying the environment at the same time? Yeah. That's it. That's all the eclipse is. It's us enjoying the environment. It's one reason and everyone got together. It didn't matter what uh, background they were from. Didn't right. matter if they were Republican, and, and, Democrat, none of that. In this stuff day mattered. and age, that yeah. is something. <laughs> it was huge. I was at the library here in Conway, New Hampshire, and at the when we reached the peak, <laughs> everyone was cheering and hugging. And mm-hmm. it wasn't even dark. You know. Uh, and I could just yeah. imagine the excitement if you were down in a big group of people down south or out west, wherever it happened to be. I just imagine that joy of like, wow, look at this. You can see the stars yeah. and planets and all the things and Oh, yeah. yeah, it was pretty neat. Well, I got to say, I'm thankful to the uh, spring tide that that eclipse brought along because uh, just before I left Charleston, I caught my first legitimate redfish on a fly. <laughs> uh, I'm glad you brought that up because that's going to be the cover art of this week's podcast. So oh, people cool. Are, are looking at their website, they'll see the photo of that uh, redfish on a fly, on a crab, you said? Yeah, this this fly, I, I man, I, what was it? Two thousand five. I came up with this crayfish pattern that I've been using down here in Lake Murray mm-hmm. uh, to catch bass and, and the pre-spawn. And and you know, I've caught bass out there. You know, some some nights I'm catching six, seven, eight fish a night, but they're like three pounds up to seven or eight pounds. And um, I sent the fly off to Rainey's. Uh, took it took forever. I mean. Getting, getting, you send them so many of the samples of the fly, and they're just all they fishing with it. Test it and all, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, they definitely were fishing with mine, but uh, you know, and that, that's a whole other story. You know, they caught a bunch of fish on that crayfish, but they said to me, you know, if you tied this a little smaller with a little flashier material, um, it would be a killer redfish fly. And and I know South Carolina is really well known for. It, the fly fishing that South Carolina is well known for is the saltwater stuff, the, the redfish, sure. the sea trout. Uh, I mean, I talked to a gentleman this weekend who's catching 100 pound tarpon on the coast. It's ridiculous. Oh, man. On a fly? Yeah. Uh, on a yeah. Fly? Oh, yeah. That's amazing. Oh, yeah. On yeah. flies. I mean, this guy, he showed, this is the guy that showed me the spot on Isle of Palms where I caught the redfish. The day before when we went down there, he just kind of bounded ahead into the, into the marsh. He's like, dude, there's one over there. Let me just get a shot at it and show you how it's done. <laughs> I mean, that fish was 30 inches long. But, I mean, he's throwing a little shrimp fly that's 
it's on a size six hook. It might have been an inch, inch and a half long. And the fish he was casting to was 30 inches long with a tail that was probably eight inches top to bottom. And he's casting to it with a eight foot long four weight fly rod. I mean, we're talking about the kind of fly rod that you take to the mountains to catch six inch long brook trout. That's and amazing. Yeah. I saw the photo. Fast, but still. I saw the photo of that guy. Now I fish, I do a lot of fishing in Charleston when I go down there and I'm afraid to wade in because of the pluff mud. I was too. I mean, yeah. I, I was. I was very lucky. I mean, this kid grew up on olive palms. So he knew. I, I say kid. He's thirty years old. Yeah. But um, yeah. I mean, and I was. I was shocked. I mean, when I got in there, um, it was. It was pretty. Pretty. You know, it was, it was. There was a little bit of mud. You know, maybe three inches deep, but it was hard bottom under that. That's so. not bad. If there's oysters to step on, that's even better. But if yeah. people don't know what pluff mud is down in the Charlotte, <laughs> yeah, uh, down, the, down the Charleston area, the yeah, mud, the mud down there could be several feet thick, uh, uh-huh. and it's like it's called pluff mud because if it's water on top of it, when you step in, you just sink all the way in. Oh, and yeah. you can get sunk, you can sink all the way in, you can drown, you can get stuck, people you can lose real your, trouble. Yeah, we lose our shoes a lot. Um, you can you can strand your boat on it and have to be there. All, Till the next tide. Oh, too. that happened. I went fishing yeah. um, with one of our friends down there, and we were we got stuck in it, and we had to wait the tide in. But the really cool thing was, at low tide and stuck in the pluff mud, the dolphins come in and chase all the little manhattans and whatever fish up. That is cool to see. So we were yeah. like two feet from these dolphins. So that was totally fun. yeah. And you know, uh, if you have bait, you can catch uh, blue crab all during low tide, no problem. <laughs> so ah. While you're stuck, just catch a blue crab and stock up on those guys. Neat. Yeah. So way fun. Anyway, we're a little bit off the news here, but let's get back to it. By the way, um, I also I want to mention talk about you tie your own flies. Uh, you sent me a bunch of flies, and my best fish on a fly I ever caught, I caught on your fly. Awesome. On, Very cool. On a crayfish pattern. So that was that that bass. Yeah. Yeah. That that is the crab pattern. Actually, it's it's the crab version of the crayfish. Wow. Well, it's I did, perfect. I thought I'd, I thought I'd sent you the, the crayfish, but hey, whatever works. That, that's cool. It wasn't a crayfish. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, it's funny when I first tied it. Um, this, uh, I guess, resort owner from from Argentina. I was at a at the, I was at the fly fishing show in Charlotte. I, I reserved a booth to just demo tying the fly, and I was sitting next to a guy by the name of Craig Rindo. Now, Craig is is really well known in fly in the world of fly fishing in Atlanta. Uh, he ties some really innovative stuff. Um, so he was at his booth. I had shown up a day, a day late, which I got chewed out for that. They were like, that's not cool. You mm-hmm. reserved the table. Well, I mean, it had snowed. I mean, we're down South when it snows, everything shuts down. You know, I, I, I know, I know, you know, and I'm from New York. I, I have no excuse, honestly, but you know, I would have had to take a day off from school and they kind of grumbled and said, yeah, okay, whatever, just go, you know, do your thing. But I walked away from the table because I like a good fly fishing show as much as the next guy. And I wanted to go buy some materials and and because it had snowed, it was really poorly attended. I get back to my table and Craig tells me, he's like, dude, never walk away from your table. Oh, I do that all the time. (laughs) He, He says, he says, this guy showed up from Argentina. He's got a lodge down there. He goes, my hairy fodder fly, which is one of the ones that he has Rainey's producing for him. Um, he, he loved it and he watched me tie it and he said, I want to invite you down to Argentina. He goes, you just have to get the airfare down there. I'll put you up for a week. You can fish. All I need you to do is teach my guys how to tie that thing. He goes, and then he left my booth and he went next to next door to your booth and he started playing with your flies in your little test tank. And he said, those things would crush in Argentina because they look just like the crabs they have down there. Now, when he says crabs, what he means is a, a type of kind of blunt ended freshwater crayfish. Thing. Got it. Yep. But I mean, what a what a what an opportunity that I missed. I oh, mean, well, you that know. happens. <laughs> you, don't, you you'll never know how many opportunities you miss, but you also gain opportunity when you're talking to other people. So you don't know all right. the things. And it could right. have been nothing and it probably was. So <laughs> I still would have had to pay the airfare. So Yeah, screw that. You're not going. <laughs> it's still not happening. It's still Argentina. It's really far away. <laughs> yeah. All One right. Day, Moving on. This is from the right. Seattle Times. This is just uh, yesterday's news here. The headline is, please go fishing. Washington State says, uh, after farmed Atlantic salmon escape Gosh. a broken net. Have you heard this story? 
I, well, I saw it on the on the Facebook page, but I, I guess it just didn't register with me that it was in Seattle. I thought it was someplace overseas. Yeah, and it probably wasn't because it's happened either, but before it's, a few times. It, well, now, recently, funny, I guess. It, what happens all the time, actually, and there's there's always been open season on Atlantic salmon uh, in public waters in the Puget Sound because uh, holding pens always break. Wow. They always break. Eventually, they break, and huh. you, and seals tear holes, and them all kinds of stuff happen. But this was a bigger deal. Uh, so it's open season on Atlantic salmon as the public is urged to help mop up a salmon spill. Oh, no, uh, salmon spill yeah. from a damaged net pen holding <laughs> 305,000 fish at a oh gosh. At Cook Agriculture Fish Farm on near Cypress Island, which is in the Puget Sound, in the Straits of Juan de Fuca. Uh, right. Lumi Fishers, sure. yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm not going to read the whole story. But basically about 5,000 fish escaped this. Uh, and what happened is the tides were ex- extremely high. Uh, and what happened is um, one, of the, one of the big chains holding the net together broke. And it twisted the walkway around the net. These are huge net, net pull, holding pens with a floating walkway around so workers can work on the net and, and tend it. And because the way it broke and the walkway twisted and broke, workers could not get out onto it to fix the net. So thousands and thousands of fish escaped. Huh. Now they say these fish are uh, about 10 pounds each. They don't know exactly oh how many uh, have got away, um, but they, have to, they, they know how many were in there to begin with. So as they mop up and kill all the fish in the net, they'll know how many got out. But they don't want these fish mixing with the native fishes of Washington, yeah. uh, the Chinooks especially. That's what I was wondering. I figured you know, they're, they're worried about them diluting the uh, genetics of the, the native fish, huh? Yeah, but I don't even think that's possible because you're talking about Atlantic salmon, which are I think they're oh. they're not they're they they're they're different kind of fish. Yeah, they're, no. they're more of a char, I think, than a no, salmon. No, that, that wouldn't work. No, but they will. They, but they will. <laughs> they'll, they'll mix in as far mop as mop up like, a lot of those those resources, a lot of the food. You got sources. your resource issues. You have disease. Yeah. Uh, you also have just kind of a weird fish doesn't belong. So, right. Uh, and and I likely can reproduce in those waters, but not impossible. I don't know. I mean, I read a book a few years ago called A Totally Synthetic Fish, and it's mm-hmm. all about the history of stocking bro- uh, rainbow trout. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they came from the McLeod River, not far from where my brother lives in California. Right. They call um, them the California guys. trout, and when they when they first started importing them to New Hampshire. Yeah, the, so, yeah, the guys that, that brought them back to the East Coast actually were trying to bring Pacific salmon to the Atlantic coast. That didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, they, they brought the other fish, which I guess the Native Americans thought of as trash fish, which were the rainbow trout that we see everywhere now. Yeah. But, yeah, the Pacific taking Pacific salmon to the Atlantic coast didn't work. I would think the opposite would probably be true. Yeah, it's funny because they even tried – Putting um, well, lang salmon are pretty adaptable, so they do well in fresh water, right? They make them landlocked. Yeah, yeah. You can that's catch true. Uh, Chinook salmon in the Great Lakes, which they don't belong there. They're not naturally occurring there. They, they huh. brought them out from Washington and California, so uh, they do stick in some places because all anadromous fish can adapt to fresh water. That's why you're able yep, to have true. your your striped bass. Right. The striped bass, a lot of people don't know, are anadromous like a salmon, which means born in fresh water and migrate to the ocean and back again. So theoretically, those can be landlocked. Uh, in New Hampshire, our big landlock besides salmon uh, is the white perch. And, right. And, they are a nuisance everywhere. I, they're, and, they're, and they're so fun to catch. <laughs> so <laughs> It's we, a good thing they're tasty because, I mean, I, I encourage people around here to take every one they catch. Yeah, I mean, we're allowed 25 a day. Well, we have no limit. Yeah. I mean – yeah, they eat other fish's eggs, and and every someone always decides it's a good idea to put them in landlocked, you know, reservoirs and stuff. And mm-hmm. it, it really never is because the game fish, the stripers, the largemouth bass, you know, they if they have a choice between that and a threadfin shad, they're going to eat that threadfin shad every time. Right. Well, I mean, here's they don't the question: want to eat something hey, well, uh, So, striped bass aren't native to your fresh waters. Oh yeah, they are. Landlocked. The yeah, they're the state fish, but they're not native. Uh, they're not landlocked naturally. No, um, but they were here before they landlocked yeah. them. Now, um, what about largemouth bass? Are they native? Sure. Okay, they're not up here, right? So we look at huh. we we look at like some fish as like invasive. Like, oh, I, everyone's like, I hate rock bass. Kill them all. And I'm like, are, well, wait rock, a rock bass are they invasive up there? Well, some people say. I mean, they're, are they're non-native up there? Oh God, no, rock bass. Um, 
White uh, rock bass, smallmouth bass, largemouth bass, bluegills, pumpkin seeds. None of them are native. Really? Yep. Oh, gosh. I didn't know that. They all came from the south. They huh. just try to escape the oppression of the south. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you guys can impress a, a, oppress them with your fishing for them up there. We you know? do. We totally do. <laughs> but nobody calls a bass invasive, largemouth bass invasive. No, that's uh, true. But I would argue that they're as invasive as anything else. Uh, if they, but because there's an economy built around them. We don't call yeah. that, right? Uh, well, and that's that's the the rainbow trout is kind of losing that status of being so, um, I guess, favored. Okay. Um, you know, that's what that book was all about. They're saying that you know some of these high mountain lakes that they stock them in uh, used to have endangered. Uh, Frog populations, and they're barely hanging on because rainbow trout eat just about anything. Oh, they're voracious. So, yeah, they're they're eradicating rainbow trout in a lot of places. I love I love when um, like <laughs> some places they call the rainbow steelheads. Sometimes they call them rainbows, but they're identical fish. Yeah, like they're biologically yeah. the same animal, uh, and they just they name them based on regional whatevers. But there's yeah yeah they're the same, uh, but the steelheads th- th- in theory get bigger than a, than a than a rainbow. I'm usually, sure usually some, because they're sea run. I'm sure there's some genetic differences though because well, that's variation uh, though, right? It's not so, so they're the same animal, but right, there's variation. Right. It'd be like uh, you versus me. Like you might be taller than I am. I think they've been bred though. I think some of those are, are, are populations that have, have adapted different, you know, um, traits. Right. I mean, but those traits are, don't make them that different biologically. True. It's true. just variation. You know, but yeah, right. it's like it's, it's like still, it's still a, a chihuahua trail. versus a great dane, right? Right. They're exactly. both dogs. They're, gotcha. They're both dogs, but they have variation. But they can breed together. Right. And you still have dogs afterwards. So, right. Yeah. I mean our, so our strain down maybe here. a strain of a, a, a different strain of rainbow trout. Right, exactly. Our strain down here actually is a cutthroat strain. It makes them extra aggressive. So cutthroat's um, not a rainbow trout? Not in the same like I didn't I thought that was a different trout entirely. Uh, no, they they they'll they'll intermingle. I have um, no idea. Absolutely, there. That's part of the problem with the rainbow trout out west is that the native strains of cutthroats are being uh, diluted because they'll breed with rainbows, and you get these things called cut bows. Oh, and then those uh, cut bows are like mules, right? They can't reproduce, or I'm not sure. Um, the ones the ones that we have do reproduce, but you can see inside the gill flap there's there's a little bit of light uh, orange there. So somewhere down the down the line, they they were mixed with cutthroats, um, and they are they are very aggressive. Yeah, so but, a lot of uh, like in New Hampshire, our hybrids we get um, tiger trout. That's one I've never caught. I, they, I've seen one before. They look really cool. They're really cool. That's a uh, I think it's a brook trout. Uh, what is it? Brook and a brown trout. Brook and a brown. Like and, but but tiger trouts can't reproduce. Right, they're only they're like a mule, right? They're 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 not a so they're not a species because they can't right. reproduce. Um, and then we also have oh my gosh, my brain is turning off. Um, brookies and um, lake trout will also reproduce together. Really? Yeah. And that's are, got to look interesting. And that's really, and I and I and the name is skipping my brain right now. But also huh. it also results in a mule-like fish that can't reproduce, and I just can't think of the name of it right now. But. But Very yeah, so cool. it all come, fish are funny, right? Like that, it's they're all over the place. <laughs> all oh right, yeah. Let's move forward on our news here. We got one more story I really want to talk about tonight. This is from the Boston Herald, and this is really important to talk about because uh, this is actually talking about a conservation win, but it's it's really interesting. Um, latest shark incident prompts Cape Cod politician to pu- push a deadly plan. That's hard to read. Latest shark incident (laughs) prompts Cape Cod politician to push deadly plan. Uh, Yeah. So this is important. So what happened recently in Boston or in Cape Cod is uh, tourists witnessed great white sharks, which are critically endangered, eating seals, which are uh, are making a comeback. Oh, the horror. The horror. I saw an animal (laughs) eating today. No way. Uh, and people are scared because sharks are scary, right? I guess so. So a, Barns- a Barnstable County commissioner is proposing a controversial shark hazard mitigation strategy after a shark attacking a seal off Cape Cod Beach Monday sent terrified swimmers and surfers scrambling to shore. Commissioner mm-hmm. Ron Beatty is looking to deploy baited drum lines with hooks near popular beaches in the hopes of catching great white <laughs> sharks. 
We're going now to that boat. sounds like a plan. Let's mm-hmm. bring the bait closer to the beach. Exactly. Yes. Uh, a protocol that he says has been successfully implemented in South Africa and Australia. Large sharks found hooked but still alive would be shot, he said, and their bodies would be discarded at sea. Oh, poor sharks. Well, what's going on? I mean, people well, are dragging them behind boats, shooting them off the side of their boats. This guy wants to shoot a shark. Mm-hmm. Well, well, come on, people. Let, let me finish this. So from my viewpoint, Sorry. based upon a sharp, <laughs> the sharp increase of shark-related attacks and incidents around Cape Cod in recent years, there's a clear and present danger to human life as a result of the growing problem, Beatty said, although he didn't cite any statistics. A motivating factor for, for his proposal, he said, was Monday's shark attack on a seal off Nauset Beach, which was crowded with people. Now, um, this... This was all over Facebook, and I want to kind of share the Facebook responses. Now, I know conservationists see shark come back as a win, right? Absolutely. Uh, fishermen see the large populations of seals as a nuisance. Yeah, uh, I can see and, that. Yeah, but they're wrong. Uh, and they blame <laughs> <laughs> and and they blame they but they blame the seals for eating codfish, right? They don't okay. blame their nets. They blame oh, the no, seals. No, never. <laughs> so, so seals have been protected for a while and have made a really strong comeback, right? Huh. Sharks have been protected for a long time. And because – so here's a, there's three things happening. There's a moratorium on cod fishing, right? So you right. have a large – so the cod population is growing really well right now. There's tons that, of cod. That's really good to hear. Right. Now seals eat fish. They're going to eat the sick cod. They're not, they're not chasing down large cod that are fast and strong. And the hmm. seals are making a strong recovery. So now seals are the primary food item for great white sharks. And so you see the pattern here? The great white yeah. sharks, so everyone has food. And they're yeah, coming the, back. the circle of life. Yeah, it's perfect, <laughs> I mean, right? And I, mean, and I didn't hear them talk about people being eaten by great white sharks. Um, no. I missed that part of the story. So, so, but there's yeah. a moratorium on cod anyway. Right. People aren't supposed to be catching them to eat them anyway. So, what's the problem? Well, the problem is, is, is uh, there, there's people. They're afraid it's going to hurt the population. Right. They're they're like, oh, the, the the seals still get to eat. How come the seals can eat and I can't? Huh. Yeah. Well, so the, the seals get to eat anyway. <laughs> yeah. And we did a whole show on this with uh, Speak Up for Blue a few months ago, and and uh, it, it's really it's it's this it all this is what it looks like when conservation is winning. When, when good That's, things yeah. environmentally are happening. Shark coming back, really cool. Do I understand why people are scared? You bet your ass I do. Uh, yeah, I guess so. I would be running out of that water really fast also. <laughs> you know, my thing is people don't get out in nature. They don't they don't see this stuff. It's, right. it's out of their mind. It's out of sight, out of mind. I mean, a few years ago, some teachers, we, we went on a teacher's retreat to um, Banner Elk, North Carolina. It was like a four and a half hour drive. And where I teach is Lexington, South Carolina. It's 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 the country. I mean, mm-hmm. if I move, if I drive five miles down the road from my school, there are collard fields. There's there's farms. My kids couldn't tell you they're there, you know, but they're there. Um, but back to Banner Elk, we go out there and rent these cabins on the side of the mountain. It's a skiing mountain. And the first morning we wake up, and one of the older ladies, she was easily in her sixties, if not in her seventies wakes up and, and they they the, the ladies in their cabin saw a deer. They saw a buck right oh, cool. outside their window first thing in the morning. Yeah, really cool. Do you know how many deer there are in Columbia, South Carolina and Lexington? Oh, I mean, sure. I see them South, in my backyard yeah. and I'm in downtown Columbia. I see them like half a dozen, ten times a year. And this lady actually said she had never seen a deer in her life, like in real life. How does that happen? You've been on this planet for six, seven decades – in the country, and you've never actually seen wildlife. Well, maybe she wasn't looking. Uh, no, but, I'm but sure she wasn't. And I think, I think more importantly with wildlife is, especially look at like carnivores, right? Mm-hmm. Even humans. Eating is an act of violence. Yeah. There's no getting around it's it. It's got to die for you to live. <laughs> and by the way, that, even vegetarians, you, yeah. you have to kill something for you to live. I, you know, whether or not you think it's right or wrong. It doesn't matter. Uh, and everything eats, right? Um, right. But I'm going to read through some of the Facebook responses here f- about the shark because they're kind of covered it. First of all, I'm going to play a little audio from Captain Sean from Maine, tunafishing.com. Uh, <laughs> one of our favorite salty anglers, also a shark um, fisherman. Uh, and he, he and I disagree on a lot of things, but we like him anyway. So here's Captain <laughs> Sean. 
Hello, fish nerds. Captain Sean here. Uh, so my take on the uh, whole shark mess down on the Cape is if you swim with seals, uh, you're going to swim with sharks. Big sharks eat seals. You look like a seal when you're swimming. Don't swim with seals. <laughs> uh, all right. And uh, let's see. From Facebook, our friend Craig said, kill the limited amount of sharks or the overabundance of seals as answer. <laughs> so oh, uh, he's one of the anti-seal people, I think. Gotcha. Uh, our friend Daryl says, the amount of seals and sharks we have now is the amount we're supposed to have. It's funny how the last few years have been banner years for stripers despite the amount of seals. Killing the whites is an absolutely abhorrent idea to anybody with half a brain. I'm with him. I'm with him too, except for the fact that I don't think it's stupid. It makes you stupid because you disagree with this. Right. Well, I, I think it makes you uninformed. Exactly. And, and we're all uninformed in some areas. We all have our gut reaction. And uh, this person obviously has theirs. Um, our friend Chris says, Yep. Predators eat sick fish, thus protecting the schools. Kill the predators, and you kill the schools with disease that they spread. So that's a fair answer. Yeah. Our friend Edward says, all of the seal-loving (laughs) a-holes, leave the sharks alone. They are being natural, eating what they are supposed to. All you privileged privileged to live there or visit on the vacation need to understand you don't own the ocean. You don't like sharks. Don't effing go down there. So Edward is very angry uh, at this conversation, and rightly so. I think killing a species that was almost gone because you're afraid of eating food is crazy. Uh, Our friend Jared says, we have a huge seal problem. The state doesn't want to deal with it, so they need to call the the seals and the sharks. (laughs) So (laughs) a lot of people think the seals are a problem. They are uh, wrong. (laughs) Yeah, I didn't realize they were protected. I thought I, I thought maybe the seals were just becoming a nuisance. No, I, and, and it's hard to see. Again, it's defining nuisance. They see them eating fish, and therefore they think I'm not catching fish because that seal caught one. Right. Yeah. I mean, down here it's gators. Yeah. Uh, we we had two gators show up in the canal right in my neighborhood, and uh, people were very afraid of them and saying, you know, we got to shoot them. Oh, can't do that. Relocate them. Not the greatest idea either. So you know, we've got our signs up that have been there for. Three, four years now, just watch your dog when you're walking it along the canal. <laughs> it's like walking, walking a hamburger. So Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Uh, our friend uh, David Perry, he's from wickedfish.com. Uh, he's a previous estimate on seal populations in and around Cape Cod, claimed they were near 20,000. The newest data says they're well over 50,000. So plenty of food for the uh, sharks, although I think David's on the side of culling the seals, which I am not on that side yet, although uh. I can be convinced. Um, I, I think if they've got a strong population, not culling, but you know, allowing a hunt for food, I could probably support if they're strong populations. But I don't, I don't have the information to make that call, and nor do I ever want to make that decision. <laughs> yeah, I'm not hunting seals. Gotta uh, wonder if they're good to eat either. <laughs> if they're, uh, yeah, hunting them just for the sake because you want to catch yeah. more fish, I, I don't support that. Um, our friend Jason says, "How about we stay out of their home if we don't want the risk of attack?" Um, Rich Collins, our, um, our fly fishing correspondent says, is swimming really that important to the world to muck up the ecosystem? (laughs) Uh Um, Kenneth says too much money involved from vacationers. So that's why, uh, that's why they want to kill the sharks. So the vacationers can spend their money. Yeah. Uh, but it goes on and on like that. So it's just like Jaws, just like (laughs) Jaws. We're going to need a bigger Island. (laughs) <laughs> so, but, but, you know, my take on the whole thing is right now we're at a good point con- for conservation, um, with, with, with striped bass, with, uh, cod, with seals, with, with sharks, they're coming back. And when these things come back, there'll be increased human interaction. There probably will be a shark attack on a human at some point. It, it's probably going to happen because we're in their space. Um, it's unlikely, but you know, we're talking about, it's possible, right? Yeah. Uh, should we, should we kill all the white sharks because it's possible? Um, should we get rid of, I mean, if you're really afraid of people dying, stop driving cars. If you run, yeah. if you do the math, the most dangerous thing you do every day is drive your car, not swim in the ocean. So if, it's if funny you, that, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Oh, it's funny that it reminds me of, uh, the guys I fished with last night. Um, 
he the the one guy I noticed he had shorts on and is is there was like a slice mark two of them in his leg, and it looked to me like he'd been bitten by a shark. So I asked him. I said, you know, so he's from Palm Beach. I said, did you get bitten by a shark? And he, he coming back to that whole safety thing. He said when he was younger, he fell out of the boat and got sliced by the by the prop. I bet that happened more than shark attacks. <laughs> I bet it does. Yeah. That sounds terrible too. But yeah. Well, anyway, we got to wrap this show up. We're done. We're out of time. Yeah. So you can continue this conversation online on the Fish Nerds Podcast Group. It's a very active group. Just go to Fish Nerds Podcast Group on Facebook and join up, and you'll have some fun with us. So that's it. You've listened to a couple of Fish Nerds when you should have been fishing. We'd like to thank our families for supporting us while we podcast, go on fishing quests, and do all sorts of silly things that nerds do. If you'd like to support Fish Nerds, you can go to patreon.com and search for The Fish Nerds and help us crowdfund this podcast. Special thanks to Michael Frank from Frank's Fly Art. Thanks to Hugo uh, for his uh, fish, and thanks to the sharks, especially. (laughs) And until next time, follow the code of the fish nerd. Spawn early and often. Avoid free lunches with strings attached. Swim against the current every chance you get. You did it. <laughs>